Uh, Dr. Tom Cowan discovered his life's, life's purpose while teaching gardening as a Peace Corps volunteer in South Africa when he read Nutrition and Physical Degeneration by Weston A. Price, as well as Rudolf Steiner's work on biodynamic agriculture. These events inspired him to pursue a medical degree. Dr. Cowan graduated from Michigan State University College of Human Medicine in 1984 after his residency in family practice at Johnson City Hospital in Johnson City, New York. He set up a medical practice in Peterborough, New Hampshire. Dr. Cowan relocated to San Francisco in 2003. He is the principal author of the book, The Fourfold Path to Healing, the co-author of the Nourishing Traditions book of Baby and Child Care, and the newly released and fantastic book, Vaccines, Autoimmunity, and the Changing Nature of Childhood Illness. His presentation today is titled Normal Immune Function and Vaccination Interference. Please welcome Dr. Thomas Cowan. Is there a, okay. Thank you for coming. Sort of, it's uh, usual when you do a talk on vaccines, it's basically the meeting of the Women's Garden Club. <laughs> Occasional male comes to the place. And just uh, for full disclosure, uh, I'm not a Bush. <laughs> <coughs> I'm a Cowan. And as far as I know, the biggest nefarious thing we've ever done, actually, I don't know of any, except my grandmother uh, used to accuse my father's family of being horse thieves back <laughs> in Eastern Europe. I don't know whether that was true or not, but I heard that a lot. I also, um, just as a note, of sty a stylistic note here, uh, Rudolf Steiner, who's definitely influenced my thinking a little bit, more than a little bit, used to say when you talk, you should know what the first thing you say is and the last thing you say, and everything else comes from the energy of the room. Uh, so that's sort of how I do it, so you won't see a lot of slides. And a lot of, this is, I'm appealing to your imagination. And if you go to sleep, that decreases the energy of the room. <laughs> So I, I live in fear of being boring, and I hope that's not the case. Uh, and I, I just want to say, too, that I really, it's extremely unusual for me, like almost never, for me to follow another medical professional, i.e. doctor, and come away thinking I mostly agree with what I just heard. So I can't, I was, <laughs> maybe the first time in 20 years. And he, he Zach came with some profound questions. Uh, again, a difference in style here is I wrote this book, Vaccines, Autoimmunity, and the Changing Nature of Childhood Disease. And as strange as this may sound, uh, the reason I wrote this book was approximately now, I hate to admit it, 50 years ago, I had the question in my mind as I w about a 12-year-old, how come every time I get sick, I go from I feel fine, and then I feel like a sore throat, and then I get a fever, and then I get snot, and then I get better, right? That's how it goes. How many people have had the experience of you feel fine, and then you get snot, and then you get fever, and then you get better. No, you, maybe three out of whatever. It always goes the other way around. And that's why 50 years later, I wrote this book to try to answer the question, why does it happen in that order? Now, the problem is I may not get there in this talk because I only have a certain amount of time. So usually people, and by the way, if somebody could raise their hand when it's about 10 minutes, then maybe I'll try to answer that question. Or I'm not sure because I may answer it as I go. But the answer to that question, I think, is the secret of medicine, just in that little simple sort of parable. So that's essentially the question I came to 50 years ago, just thinking about life. And then I was able to answer it in this book, and that's what I'm going to describe today. 
So a lot of times people come to me, and actually I am going to talk about vaccines. So uh, 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 a lot of patients over the years have come to me and said they want help with their immune system. And the first thing I usually say to them is, you don't have an immune system. You have at least two immune systems. And in order to understand how this whole thing called life and health works, and especially in relation to vaccines and children's illness, we really have to know how these two immune systems actually work together. And so, even though I think Zach brings up some really good points about where the origin of these infectious diseases come from, and it's by no means what we think. And I don't often do this, but I will refer occasionally here to some things that Rudolf Steiner said. Uh, I don't know if everybody here even knows him. But he, he pointed out that viruses are basically excretions of the cell and that what the infectious, contagious part is actually fear, not the actual agent. However, I'm going to ignore that for a, mo a moment, even though at some level it's probably true, and just talk a little bit more normal uh, immunology. So if we're essentially a child and we're naive, meaning we've never experienced something like chicken pox before, and then we get exposed to the chickenpox virus. The virus gets into our cells by the hundreds, thousands, maybe millions, and interferes with the ability of that cell to function properly. And that becomes an intolerable situation for the life of the organism and for the life of the cell. And so there is a specific recourse that the body has to that situation of cell with stuff in it. And that recourse is to call forth the cell-mediated immune system, so-called because it's based in the white blood cells. And there's all sorts of chemicals which are recruited to bring the white blood cells to that area. And the white blood cells job, like some sort of Pac-Man thing, is to digest and, there, and then eliminate those infected cells. And that's such an important point to clarify that it's not the virus that makes you sick, it's the activity of the cell-mediated reaction clearing the infected by the thousands or millions of cells out of the body. How do I know that? Because you can infect somebody with a virus that causes illness, like chickenpox or measles or anything, and you can give a medicine to suppress the activity of the cell-mediated immune system so it doesn't function, and the person will never show signs of being sick. Being sick, if there's anything you remember from this talk, being sick is a reflection of your own activity to clear out cells that are become dysfunctional out of your body. And I would say not only is it the way that that happens, it's actually the only way that that happens. Now, if you take somebody and infect them with a virus or a chicken pox or something and totally suppress their, their cell-mediated immune system, you can actually kill them with the virus, for instance. But they will never be, quote, sick. And when I say sick, I mean fever, rash, mucus, cough, all the things that we commonly associate with being sick. Being sick is an, your own activity. It's a therapeutic cleansing response. It can happen to viruses. It can happen to Roundup. It can happen to anything that interferes with the healthy life of the cell. That's important point number one. Now, we don't want to have a situation where we keep getting chicken pox every six weeks over and over through our life, right? That would be a 
dysfunctional, inconvenient, not very fun life. So we have a second part of the immune system called the humoral or antibody-based immune system whose function is to remember what happened. And basically it, it recognizes and codes for an antibody against a certain part of that chicken pox virus. So it's usually a protein on the coating of the virus. The body remembers that, makes antibodies to that part of the virus. By the way, the cell-mediated reaction usually takes between seven and 10 days. And then you've now successfully cleared the virus and the dead cells from your body. And then this antibody production ability takes about six to eight weeks at which case you have antibodies for life if it happened in that order, first cell-mediated clearing it, antibody production to remember it. That happens in six to eight weeks. And the reported cases of people getting measles, chicken pox, German measles, mumps, twice in their life who've gone through those two, that two-step process is almost zero. It is a completely foolproof process. You clear the virus as long as you don't interfere with the process by giving antipyretics, meaning aspirin or Tylenol or children's Motrin. That's the mechanism of clearing the debris from your tissues. And then you remember what happened with the antibody arm of your immune system, and then you're immune for life. And that's the way Humans interacted with so-called pathogens for the entire life of our species. It's just encapsulated in that story right there. Now, that was the case. So when you go back in history and look at the history of medicine, you find over and over again everything from Hippocrates saying, Give me a medicine to produce a fever and I can cure any disease. And then you find sweat lodges and fever therapy and homeopathy bringing on rashes. And you find this over and over again. Because the job of a doctor is to distinguish between the therapy and the disease. And we do it extremely poorly. And what I mean by that. A very simple example, if you get a splinter in your finger and you don't take it out, you make pus, right? Is the pus the therapy or the disease? The therapy. How many people think the pus is the disease? Nobody, because nobody here got their flu shot last year. <laughs> <coughs> The splinter is the disease. The pus is the therapy for the disease. And here's how you get chronic disease. You go to the doctor, he thinks, oh, I learned in medical school, pus means infection, uh, acinobacter, blah, 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 strep, this. You have an infection, you need antibiotics, you get rid of the pus, the pus goes away, the splinter stays, what happens next? It happens again and again. And now you have chronic splinteritis disease, <laughs> which means a tumor formation around the splinter that your body then says, the heck with it, we'll just leave it there for the rest of your life. Now, you could say, that's such a silly example, which is why I use it. Nobody would be stupid enough to make that mistake. But I can tell you approximately 50,000 times a day or a week or something in the United States, somebody puts splinters in their lungs, right? That's called smoking. It doesn't have to be a physical splinter. It could be cigarette smoke. It could be on and on and on and on. So what happens next? You get pus. Why do you have pus? to get the debris out of your lungs. Very simple. You go to the doctor, he says you have bronchitis, you need antibiotics, 
You have this bacteria living in your tissues. The bacteria, as Zach said, are scavengers. You wouldn't have a compost pile that you put things that don't belong in a compost pile, and then you will breed different bacteria, and then you go and say, yeah, I see the compost pile has an infection. I'm going to give it an antibiotic, and I will heal the compost pile. That's nonsense. It happens every single day in every doctor's office. Debris in the human being, they react with their cell-mediated reaction. Fever, pus, don't feel good, cough, mucus. They stop that from happening, and then they do that twice a year for 20 years, and then what happens? The person gets cancer. Why do they get cancer? Well, two reasons. One, you put debris in your lungs that's toxic. But that isn't enough. You have to put de debris in your lungs, and then somebody has to stop it from getting out. That's the job of the doctor. That is <laughs> pediatrics in, in modern America. That's what we do. The people put debris in their lungs, in their tissues. They respond appropriately by getting it out, by trying to get it out. Because we don't understand that that's what's happening, we suppress it. We claim it's an infection. We claim it's chronic bronchitis. We claim it's a genetic disease. We claim you have a mutation that doesn't allow you to get debris out of your lungs. It's none of it is real. That's how the body works. And I would contend it's the only way the body works. Now, I've had an interesting biography, besides being from horse thieves. <laughs> but I can tell you, I've never stolen a horse that I know of. So there I am, trained in sort of anthroposophical medicine, which is all about the polarity between chronic disease and acute disease. In other words, the theory here is the only way you can get chronic disease, like asthma, which actually has the formation of crystals in your lung, is to suppress the pneumonia that comes to heal it. So when I was in medical school, I had a very dramatic example of this, a little boy in our clinic who had the worst case of asthma anybody ever saw. Asthma, you get a, a hardening of the lung tissue. The body comes along with inflammation, which is another interesting thing because nowadays we blame everything on inflammation. Inflammation typically is a therapeutic response. So anyways, uh, it has inflammation that makes him wheeze. Little boy comes in with, to the hospital with 104 fever and a complete whiteout of his lung. And for the first time, he wasn't wheezing. He was cured of his asthma because the warmth and the pus and the infection, it's actually in Nelson's pediatrics, has a therapeutic effect on the asthma process. So I saw him with the attending pediatrician. I already knew that at the time. And I said, hey, look, he's not wheezing. Why is that? He said, oh, well, having pneumonia has a bronchodilator effect. So what do we do? We give him antibiotics, cure him of his pneumonia, give him his inhaler back, and that's how this thing works. So there I am now, 1988, and uh, because I do pay attention to a certain extent to things, coincidences that happen in my life. I board a plane, and I don't even remember where I was going. And there on the plane seat that I was supposed to be sitting at is an open Scientific American, October 1988. I still remember it. So this goes way back for me. And the article was called Tumor Necrosis Factor. And it was written by the head of Sloan Kettering Cancer Research Center describing their discovery of a new medicine for treating cancer. And I'm just going to read you the opening line of this, um, this article. 
Rare events properly interpreted have been the source of much progress in science. The spontaneous regression of cancer is a case in point. Before the turn of the century, a few astute physicians observed that shrinkage of malignant tumors in patients coincides with the development of bacterial infections. They postulated that infectious agents or their products might somehow fight cancer. This notion and the later data that supported it prompted decades of search for a mechanism that leads from infection to cancer regression. Some evidence suggests the bacteria do not kill tumors directly, but instead strengthen the activity of forces in the body, sounds just like Rudolf Steiner, that are capable of restraining cancer. Blah, 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 we discovered this polypeptide or protein that is produced in the body in the course of bacterial infections and kills tumors in mice. Right? There it is. Now, e interestingly, when they gave this tumor necrosis factor, this is a protein made in the course of bacterial infections that kills tumors in mice. It gives you a big fever, and they s give you Tylenol to suppress the fever, and then they say the medicine doesn't work. And everybody who goes to the Sloan Kettering Clinic with bronchitis, even though this is, this is what they found, I think, still gets bronchitis to treat their, still gets antibiotics to treat their bronchitis. So apparently they will increase their risk of getting cancer because they were already doing the therapy. Now, this story, which was written by a guy named Lloyd Olds, who was head of the Sloan Kettering Cancer Center. Uh, he got this because he was the, I think, grandson-in-law of a guy named William Coley, who developed Coley's toxins. And the story of Coley's toxins is he was a sarcoma, which is a bone cancer specialist. He was presented with John Rockefeller's, quote, friend, which was a young woman, and who knows. Uh, but he was very interested in curing her of sarcoma, which is a sort of deadly bone cancer. So they did what they did, which was the premier sarcoma clinic in the world at the time. Ewing, where the name Ewing sarcoma actually came from, was the head of the sarcoma department. And so they amputated, et cetera, her, her, the usual treatment for sarcoma, and she died eight weeks later. So Coley had the sense then to go and look at through all the records of Sloan Kettering to find out what happened to all these people they treat for sarcoma at their hospital. And turns out they all died at the usual time, except one who is a dock worker named Stein, and he went and tra and it, all he could see was operation was never done, Stein discharged from the hospital in good condition. So that was about 10 years before. He goes and tracks down Stein, who's a dock worker, who's fine. He said, what happened to you? He said, well, I was in the hospital and I got erysipelas. And I had 104 fever for a month straight. And they never could do the operation. And then they let me go, and I've been fine since. <laughs> and Coley had the good sense to not say, oh, yes, yeah, spontaneous remission, nothing to learn here. It must have been a miracle. We can't understand this. But instead, he gave the next person with sarcoma because he knew their treatment, which, by the way, is almost identical to the same treatment we use today for sarcoma. He, gave, he had them lie in the bed with a person with erysipelas. And he did that over the next 40 years. Uh, well, for the first 10 years, he had them get erysipelas. 40% got high fevers and got cured. 40% apparently died from erysipelas. <laughs> <coughs> and 20% never get erysipelas. He thought that was a high death rate from erysipelas pre-antibiotic era. So he, d he discovered a way which became Coley's toxins to inject them with the cell walls of the bacteria to give them a high fever to essentially reproduce the forces that, the, that happen when you have a fever. 
And then, after I come home from 1988 on this plane ride, out of nowhere, six months later, I get a manuscript in the mail about like this uh, with his, Coley's granddaughter, who had compiled all the cases treated by Coley and people with Coley's toxins for over 40 years. So, so I read it. I mean, you know, why not? It's amazing. <laughs> Thousands of cases. Approximately 40% of even the worst kind of cancers, he went from sarcoma to other kind of cancers, uh, were healed as long as you can get a high fever for a prolonged period of time. I can't emphasize enough a medicine that is afraid of fever, which is the purifying element of your cells, is a medicine that is carcinogenic and will always end up in the production of chronic disease. And that's where we get into the vaccine story. But the reason I put it in this context is it's not just the vaccine story. It's the story of how we think as modern doctors. It's the story of our assault on the cell-mediated immune system. The only thing we have in us that purifies our tissues and our cells. So, what happens when you give a vaccine? And I can't emphasize this enough. The whole theory of vaccineology, if there is such a word, is to bypass the cell-mediated immune system, to make it so that it doesn't happen, and then stimulate the humoral antibody immune system. That's the entire theory of why we started and why we use vaccines, in a nutshell. We don't want you to get measles because the experience of measles, the sickness of measles, comes with a high fever and rash and cough and et cetera. And of course, there's always a danger of that, even though the danger was basically, as you can see in all these charts, in 1953, 10 years before the vaccine was introduced, we went from 100 per 100,000 deaths in 1920 to basically zero in 1953, 10 years before the vaccine. So interestingly, the, if, if you look at the CDC from that area, their listing of the, of the common causes of deaths, in 1950s, in the 10 years before the vaccine, measles was right underneath lightning strikes. So it would have been a lot more sensible to send every child to school in a wetsuit even though people would complain that now my child has rickets and chafing and they complain that they go outside and it's a nice day and they, why do they have to wear this wetsuit? Because you never know when it's going to start lightning, you know. Uh, but that would have been a better, more effective public health measure at that time with probably less side effects, even though wetsuits actually do have side effects. So I wouldn't do that. In case anybody thinks doing it. Anyways, the point is, for that gain, we eliminated the most effective cell-mediated response experience a young child can have. Now, by the way, this isn't just me making this up. You would predict then, if you do analysis of this, that children who don't go through measles will have let more chronic disease than children who don't go through measles. And we find that for glioblastoma, many types of cancer, arterial sclerosis, osteoarthritis, and many other situations. That just that not going through measles puts you more at risk of having other chronic diseases later in life. Of that, it's absolutely clear in the peer-reviewed literature. And it's simply a subset of if you either suppress or don't allow or preempt the experience of, a, of your cell-mediated immune system, 
It's like being 80 and you've never lifted a weight in your life and now you want to lift 200 pounds and you can't do it because you have no functional immune system to do that with. Now the other thing that happens here, again, the entire point of doing a vaccine is to stimulate antibodies without a prior cell-mediated reaction. I would just point out that that has never happened before. That's not how human beings go through life. I mean, maybe it happens sometimes, but that's not the way it's supposed to happen. When you encounter something that's not good for you, you flush it out with your cell-mediated response, and then you remember what happened, always in that order. If you bypass that and just stimulate antibodies, and here, I must admit, is where my smart aleck tendency comes in, maybe it works, and you will end up with people with too many antibodies, right? That's the whole point of the program. What is the definition of a somebody with too many antibodies? Autoimmune disease. How do we know that somebody has Hashimoto's hypothyroidism, of which there are somewhere between 20 and 40 million people? We look for elevated antibodies in their blood. How did you get too many antibodies in your blood? Somebody gave me a medicine to make me make antibodies. That's why they're in my blood. How do you know somebody has rheumatoid arthritis? You look for antibodies called rheumatoid factor in their blood. How, do you, how did you end up with too many antibodies to your own joints in your blood? Well, somebody gave me a medicine to make me make antibodies, and by the way, they may have put it in with fetal tissue of bones and cartilage. So you mix the two together, and I can only say, what do you think is going to happen? If you put peanuts, which they started in 1998, how many people here are over 60? How many of you remember people with peanut allergies when you were a child? None. How many know somebody with peanut allergies now? Everybody. Why? If you put peanut, allergy, peanut protein, mix it with a medicine to stimulate you to make antibodies, you might do that. In which case, forevermore, sort of, unless you do something, you will have an overreactivity situation to peanuts. That's how it works. I don't know why this is such a conundrum or a controversial issue. There's at least 140 million people in the United States. Autism is hyperactive immune system response in the brain. And asthma, it's in the lungs etc., on and on and on. Now, the reason this happens, unfortunately, if you go to most doctors or pediatricians and you say, so what's in this vaccine? Well, let's take diphtheria, just a simple example. You have to have that antigen part, the part you make antibodies to, right? That has to be in the vaccine. And then normal saline, salt water, and a preservative, like vitamin C or BHT, that's in cornflakes. That's what's in a vaccine. So anybody want to take a guess? If you inject somebody with diphtheria toxin, normal saline, BHT, and vitamin C, you know what happens? Nothing. No antibodies are made because the body sees that exposure and says, no. <laughs> if I'm not going through a cell-mediated reaction first, I'm not bothering to make antibodies against this diphtheria. No antibodies are made, and even though it's actually true that antibodies are not the same as immunity from the disease, that's another interesting subject which we can't get into. 
it's similar. Let's just say for our purposes, it's similar. That experience will not give you any antibodies. So you have to put something called an adjuvant, which is a Latin word that means helper, which sounds pretty friendly. Like, why not? <laughs> Let's put a helper in there. Uh, so what's the main helper? Is aluminum. Now, aluminum's interesting because aluminum, I hear, is the second most ubiquitous, uh, that means common. I, I wouldn't have known that myself, so. Uh, the common substance on Earth. The absorption rate for oral aluminum is about 0.01%, which means we don't absorb it, which means all those years where I avoided aluminum pots, which I still avoid aluminum pots, by the way, because I don't trust it. But anyways, it probably doesn't make any difference because we don't absorb aluminum, and there is no biological system, no organism that uses aluminum for any biological enzymatic process, unlike molybdenum or zinc or iron. We use those for something, but not aluminum. Nobody, no insect, not that guy, not you, nobody uses aluminum to do anything useful. And therefore, we also don't have excretion pathways for aluminum. Why not? Because if you don't absorb it and you don't use it and you don't get it in your body, why bother to figure out how to excrete it? So I have a hint for you. You could write this down if you want, but I wouldn't. Don't write it down. <laughs> if you run into a substance like that, don't inject it into your body. <laughs> it's not good for you. Your body doesn't know how to use it. It doesn't know how to get rid of it. Now, here's the point. The reason why they do it, are they mean or stupid or greedy? I don't know. But let's just say the, the reason they do it is because it doesn't work if you don't do it. Okay. You don't make antibodies if you don't do it. Now, here's the next thing. How many people think somehow aluminum knows to have you make only antibodies to diphtheria? <laughs> right, because none of you got flu shots last year. <laughs> so you're not that stupid. It's ridiculous. <laughs> you can't possibly have a broad-spectrum biological toxin that knows just to make you make antibodies to aluminum. So it makes you make antibodies to everything that's in there, including the peanuts, including if you have some inflammation of your thyroid gland or thymus, you make antibodies against that, then the antibodies destroy the tissue, and they put out antigens, and then you make more antibodies, and then you have an autoimmune disease for life. That's how it happens, 140 million people. Is that the only way? No. But it's a big way. It is a big way that happens. And it's completely predictable. And then the more human antigens you put in there, and the more, you know, I've read so much stuff that I wish I hadn't bothered to read on the, the conferences finding leukemia viruses, et cetera. And then all this stuff in there. That's what you make antibodies to. Why do they put the stuff in? There was a very interesting paper I just read from Italy about the Infantrix uh, vaccine, which is seven vaccines, and they complained in Italy, why do they keep putting formaldehyde in the vaccine, right? Listed grade two carcinogen by the World Health Organization. Why do they put that in the vaccine? Well, they did one and they didn't put it in, they looked for the antigens, and only four of the seven antigens were present in the vaccine. The rest were degraded because the formaldehyde pickles it, and if you took it out, you don't even have the, the antigens to make you make antibodies against the measles or the diphtheria or whatever, so the whole thing is useless. And by the way, they found f five biological toxins in there, which this company which tests wine and food and they said, if they found these in the wine and food out, 
within a day, because obviously Italy doesn't want people thinking they have contaminated wine, for God's sake. <laughs> right? Nobody's going to go there anymore. Uh, but vaccines, we're good. So I have five more minutes? Five more minutes. All right. I can do five. I, yeah. The only thing I, I was going to just fin I'll, I'll finish with this, and then I have something that definitely got stimulated by, by Zach. When you, when you put this all together and you say, so why did we do all this? Well, it's because vaccines lowered the rate of deaths from all these horrible diseases. That's why. That's the answer you will be given. Now, if you said, okay, like what? So, as everybody knows, measles vaccine lowered the death rate from measles and mortality is always the best thing to study because it's the worst thing that can happen and we have the clearest statistics. It lowered it by 97%, diphtheria by 96%, mumps by 80%, pertussis by 89%. Those are not exact numbers, but pretty close. That's what you'll hear. How many people here, especially healthcare practitioners, know where those numbers came from? How many people here have heard of a paper called Rausch et al. published in JAMA in 2007? Nobody. How many people have read the paper? <laughs> Nobody, except me, which I didn't want to, but I did because I wrote this book and I figured somebody might ask me a question. I figured I should know it. So Rausch et al. is the number one cited paper in all of vaccine research. If you go to a study and they're studying how to preserve diphtheria antigen, first line, we all know that, that measles death rate was lowered by 97% because of, and, and the citation is Rausch et al. Right? So I decided to read Rausch et al. And here's what you see. You see everybody has this. You see this. This is mortality rate from measles. If you can't see that, it's just 100, 100 per 100,000 in 1920, and then one per 100,000 in 1965. And the vaccine was introduced here. So how, and it's the exact same for every other vaccinatable disease. So how did he get 97% reduction? Because it's true. If you take the number here, one per 100,000, here, 100 per 100,000, there is a 97% reduction in the death rate pre and post vaccine. It's absolutely true. You have to be very careful with these people. They're not stupid. They know how to report data, and unless you do your homework and read Rausch et al., which is long and tedious and boring, you will never see what the, what the gig is. This is where it comes from. Now, I'm going to finish, because I have five minutes. I also want to emphasize, too, or restate, re re that I must say, when Zach talks about, uh, we, we are in a dying state of the earth. How do I know that? If you read Mariner's reports from 200 years ago, that they said over and over again, you couldn't sail from California or the Pacific to Hawaiian Islands, so maybe a hundred years ago, without running into thousands and thousands of whales and dolphins and other sea creatures. Now they're gone. The entire earth is dying. 
That's the situation we're faced in. Is it all because of vaccines? No. Vaccines are absolutely part of that, as are glyphosate, chemicals, otherwise EMF exposure, et cetera. I say that because I think we ought to know what we're faced up against. And I don't say that to be sort of Debbie Downer, and I don't usually say that in talks like this, but I was inspired to put my two cents in there with this and say, at some point, we just have to realize where we are in, in this situation. And then I'm going to finish with what I call the bad news about vaccines. So what I said before, that was the good news. <laughs> Now, I say this in the spirit of, it's a quote from Rudolf Steiner. Who was Rudolf Steiner? He was the guy who founded biodynamic agriculture, one of the most widely used systems of regenerative agriculture in the world. He founded uh, the Waldorf schools, probably one of the most popular educational system in the world. He wrote the curriculum. He essentially organized the whole school. He started anthroposophical medicine and, and gave the directions for the use of mistletoe for cancer, which is arguably the most effective natural cancer medicine ever been created. He was a sculptor, and he was a painter, and his full-time job was a scholar of Goethe and a philosopher. So the, architect, the agriculture and the medicine and the farming were his hobbies. And I say that in the spirit of when people say, I say, who criticize or don't accept this, and so I say, so what do you do? Uh, I'm not sure if you're allowed to criticize Bill Gates in, in Washington. Is that legal still? Yes, yes it's illegal. Uh, so I, uh, I spend my life developing uh, devices that addict children. Right? That's what they do. So I don't know why I would believe him, him as opposed to Rudolf Steiner. Just to throw that out. Not that I want to be a disciple, and nobody wants that. You don't take his word for it. But it's an interesting take. It's a little bit long, this quote. The time will come, and it may not be far off, when quite different tendencies will come up at a Congress like the one held in 1912, and people will say, it is pathological for people to even think in terms of soul and spirit. Quote, sound people will speak of nothing but the body. It will be considered a sign of illness for anyone to arrive at the idea of any such thing as a spirit or a soul. People who think like this will be considered to be sick. And you can be quite sure of it, a medicine will be found for this. At Constantinople, the spirit was made non-existent. The soul will be made non-existent with the aid of a drug. Taking a, quote, sound point of view, people will invent a vaccine to influence the organism as early as possible, preferably as soon as it is born, so that this human being never even gets the idea that there is a soul or a spirit. So thanks for listening, and I hope to talk to more of you as the day goes on.